continuing charity knowledge that others benefited from and a righteous son who supplicates for him so uh, our aim is to improve the mortality and morbidity this is our team and uh, for a glass videos on common clinical and theory topics watch our youtube channel pnmtp and you can also join us as a member and the requirement is fcps happy to work voluntarily and and be and he should be enthusiastic and believe in teamwork this is our uh, contact email id and the good news is our website pnmtp.org is in final stage of development you can visit our website as well uh this is basically uh, the month of may is present uh, upcoming presentations and this is our today's topic which is pediatric x-rays and ct scans i am very thankful to dr maria hamid who has given us her precious time uh, for this very important topic she is consultant pediatric radiologist and head of department of pediatric radiology at nich i uh, would like to invite uh, madam maria to kindly uh, uh, brief us about this important topic uh, thank you mr radeep it's really a nice uh, opportunity uh, provided by me provided to me by pnmdp a platform for the very first time to start with the pediatric x-rays and the ct scan today to, to present in front of this forum so i'm really grateful and um, first of all i would like to add few things about before proceeding to the uh, um before proceeding to the x rays and um, the whole world of the pediatric radiology so basically thing is that the pediatrics as far as the pediatric is concerned uh, there is a lot of difference between the adult radiology and the pediatric so pediatric is a diff totally different zone and uh, pediat and the children are not the miniature adult and basically thing is that there is tremendous body differences between the children and adult uh, postures that's why uh, the important point to be noted about the pediatric x rays is very uh, important to to be notified on the x rays is is very much important so now we are proceeding with the first of all the checklist is about the normal anatomy a bit about the radiological interpretation and the next we will dig into the uh, whole of the and uh, whole of the uh, checklist what things we should add what what things we should exclude and then comes to the pathologies and certain pitfalls okay please next slide uh, ma'am uh, i'm going to share i'm just sharing the presentation okay madam there is a no screen yeah mr adi is going to share my screen just be I'm patient i'm just sharing the so as soon as the presentation is being started we are just trying to focus on a bit about the uh, checklist what things we need to add before proceeding to the chest x ray uh, i think uh, it's very important before uh, proceeding that uh, whether the x ray quality is appropriate or not the x ray which we are reading is appropriate or not whether the whole coverage should be done by the technician or not you should you should look into this first before uh, coming to the uh, pathology so thing is that the adequacy of the radiograph is very important you need to look for the apices you need to look at the costophrenic angles whether they are covered adequately or not yeah yeah i am also waiting for the screen i'm just telling you what happened adil 
Okay, you can allow me. You can allow me. Uh, I, I can connect with my laptop no, no, if you are having some problem. No, I understand. I'm just sharing. I hope everyone uh, is now seeing this thing. Yes, ma'am. You can continue. Okay. Is the screen clear to everyone now? Yes, ma'am. Please respond so that I may continue. Okay. Thank you. Please proceed to the next slide without wasting any time, because we are already running late. Next, please. So th these are the today's goals and objective as, as I have already described that we will learn about some technical factors. Then we will dig into the basic radiographic anatomy before going into detail of the pathologies, then certain pitfalls and the methodology how to read an x-ray. Next, please. So basically the reading a chest x-ray or reading an abnormality for a radiologist is just like a jigsaw puzzle. Because if you don't know about the relevant clinical examination, the re about the patient details, about the relevant clinical scenario of the patient, then you are not able to figure out what we are going to see, what we are going to learn. So it's basically a jigsaw puzzle between the clinician, between a radiologist and the patient. So to reaching up to the diagnosis is basically all three. By smudging all three, you will reach up to the final diagnosis. Next, please. Here is some background noise. Uh, are you people? Are you people able to? Hello. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I think someone's mic uh, is on. I'll mute. Yeah, you, you can mute. Thank you so much. Okay, so these are the technical factors. Before reviewing the chest x-ray, we have to define about the film quality. We have to see that is this a PA view or an AP view? PA stands for posterior to anterior, anterior to posterior, okay? So we have to check whether it's upright or it's a supine view in pediatrics. We usually here we are dealing with supine view. As you all know, that patient is unable to mobilize, patient is unable to stand. That's why we are here dealing with supine view. Then comes the whether the X-ray is being taken in a fully inspiration or an expiration. So what does it mean? We will later define it. Then comes the patient is rotated towards right or left, or patient is adequately positioned. Then comes the X-ray penetration, that here we have overexposed the film or we have underexposed the film. So all these are the relevant factors before digging into the particular pathology. We need to check all these one by one. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah, thank you. So this is the PA projection. As I say that PA stands for posterior to anterior. As here you say, there is a patient lying down. This is a axial CT cut. Here, if you say this is X-ray source, the yellow one is the X-ray source. And this is the body of the patient. As you see, this is the spine. The posterior part is the spine and anterior half is the heart. So here the beam of the X-ray is entering the patient from posterior to anterior, like from back to the front. So this is called PA projection. So what does it mean? Why we are taking PA projection and why we are taking AP projection? So the person who is ambulatory, who is moving, who is a normal person, we can take the PA projection. In adult patient, we are also dealing with the PA projection. So in PA projection, what happened? You see here, you see where, where are the scapula? The scapula are outside the field of the chest. So both scapula are outside. So in this way, in this way, we are not, we are completely and clearly visualizing the chest without any ambiguity. 
so the pathology is doesn't hidden about the bone so this is called pa view while if you locate about the clavicles they are overlying the apices here you can see the clavicles are overlying the apices okay next please so this is the basic difference between the posterior anterior projection and the good ap projection so here as i already described that scapula is seen periphery of the thorax in pa view so that the lung is clear while clavicles are project over the lung fields on the contrary in ap projection the scapula are overlying the lung and clavicle are above the apex so that the lung fields looks very obscure very hazy so it's very difficult to comment on a subtle pathology subtle pathologies can be missed in ap view so in pediatrics it's it's of extremely important and it's an extremely difficult to localize the abnormality because we are taking this x ray in an ap view now comes the markers the position of the markers is also of utmost importance because sometime by the mistake of the technician what happens they, they revert the marker back like right become the left left become the right so you are thinking that patient having that situs inversus a patient may be having the dextrocardia although it's not it's not the case so already it's a duty of the radiologist it's a duty of the clinician to check the markers next please now here this is a clear depiction beautiful description of the pa view and ap view so now what happened here you see you can see the edge of scapula that's outside the lung field while on ap view it's projecting over the chest so it's causing haziness it's causing obscuration of the chest so it's very difficult to determine the subtle pathologies again now again another difference that is of heart now if you see at pa view what happened about the heart heart is demarcated by the red arrow red marker so it's of normal contour normal contour and normal size while well, what what happened on the left side on the left side on ap view heart looks magnified this is called pseudo magnification because here your beam is towards the the heart it's uh, it's not away from the heart it's towards the heart that's why the heart looks big so it's called pseudo cardiomegaly so you can spuriously call it as a pseudo cardiomegaly next please now i have told about uh, the inclusion criteria like what things should be included otherwise you have to say that this x ray is inadequate and i want to repeat that particular x ray now you need to include the both apices the is marked by green shaded arrow and the post postophrenic angles they should be covered because subtle pleural effusions minimal amount of fluid minimal amount of air are also there or also can be hidden on these areas in just in case of uh, the pneumothorax in a supine view in a supine patient the air tends to lie and in these costophrenic angles so it's very difficult if they are not covered properly you can miss the emergency finding emergency finding so it's an emergency that's why they should be included before proceeding to the x ray you need to look for that the proper inclusion criteria is being attained by the radiogra radiographer or not thank you next next please yeah then comes the penetration now what do you mean by penetration that penetration means on proper pa view whole of the spine should be visualized now we can able to see whole of the spine here you can count 1 2 3 4 5 the vertebra the dorsal vertebra are being evident on this particular view if the film is too dark if the film is too white then you are not able to make them out so you can reject that film up front you can say that we can repeat the film because it's of not of adequate quality so because it can it can cause a spurious misinterpretation so that can lead to erroneous findings next please this is the example of under penetration and over penetration film so what's going on in under penetration the film is too white too white and scary you can't even make out any the normal anatomy on the contrary in over penetrated film look at the film how black it is 
so again you can't any you can't find any pathology okay next so there then comes the inspiration we have so far we have covered the inclusion penetration now comes the inspiration so we have to determine that patient has adequately inspired or not while dealing with the x-ray while taking the x-ray patient has adequately inspired or not but unfortunately in the pediatric patient it's very difficult it's very difficult because usually the kids are not able to uh, for, uh, cooperate us very it's very difficult to get an purely uh, adequately inspired film so you can uh, you cannot uh, take the ideal uh, scan all the time next please so here comes the ribs you can count the anterior ribs and the posterior ribs so you and in pediatric patients you have uh, almost you have at least 6 to 7 ribs uh, uh, anterior ribs to call it an educate uh, exposure film while uh, the ninth posterior ribs to call it an uh, truly inspiration film here you can in this manner you can count the film you can count the ribs next please so this is a beautiful example of the inspiratory and expiratory view so on inspiratory view if you uh, trying to uh if you trying to this uh, count the ribs the anterior ribs on the right side in a pa view here comes the sixth six anterior ribs so this is this is called educate films so in educate films there is a diaphragm beautiful looking diaphragm the clavicle the lung is almost normal and the black while on the expiratory view if you see there are hardly uh, and three anterior ribs so in this way you can find there is a pseudo consolidation pseudo white pseudo haziness in the basis the left diaphragm is also not well seen it's very obscured if you see there is a curry sitting down so you can see there must be some consolidation sitting there there must be some fluid or maybe the pleural effusion so it is basically all this because of expression not the inspiration so it's a duty of the radiologist or a good clinician to, to before commenting on this uh, particular consolidation or haziness to always see and watch what's going on whether patient has taken the expiration inspiration in a full manner or not so it's it's very important again to determine the quality of the film is adequate or not next so here comes the final thing that is rotation so patient is is educately placed sitting uh, uh, supine in a in a standard position or it's rotated towards the right or the left so what's the criteria of uh, non rotation basically the criteria is that you need to check the spinous process in between the two clavicles so you need to measure the distance on either aspect on the right and left it should be equal if it's in if it's the distance is greater on one side then you can call it that patient is rotated towards the same side next please so here comes the radiographic opacities and contrast so basically before understanding the pathology you must know what are the these uh radiographic opacities so metal usually provide us the very bright very jet bright density on the x ray like bullet like surgical clips they will provide you significantly wide density on the x ray on the contrary air is another extreme air will provide you the jet black density on the x ray like it provide you hello am i audible yes madam okay some someone has written that voice isn't clear that's why i'm asking okay thank you thank you so bone calcium soft tissue fluid and fat these all are intermediate densities so they will provide you somewhat gray some white white somewhat black so in indeterminate densities between two extremes extreme white that is metal extreme black jet black that is air so in between all these things i will describe you in the next slide next please so here comes the metal take the example of fridge so what happens all the x rays when they strike towards the metal like bullet 
like surgical clips or anything that is pertinent to the any zip in the in the clothes any button in the clothes they all are metal so what happen the x ray will strike them and all the x ray return back without reaching up to the film or cassette so it returns the totally white density on the cassette as seen here next and what about the air air absorb all the x ray all the x rays are being uh, transferred through that air and all the x ray will reach up to the film cassette so resulting in the more blacker appearance on the film next please while the intermediate densities in which the calcium fluid and fat the soft tissues are included so what happens some are reflected some x rays are reaching up to the cassette so you will get a different range of the shadow shades of the gray like some are white some are black so intermediate not too extreme not too white not too black so these all are producing the intermediate densities like calcium will give you somewhat white and the fluid will give you black next please so this was uh, about the a little bit about the radiographic physics and the some technical aspects i hope i'm not uh, getting you bored now uh, we are proceeding to the chest x ray anatomy next please so uh, it's all depend upon upon the radiologic uh, approach whether you are dealing with from inner side to the outer side or you are heading from outer to in so in my routine practice i would check it from the center towards the periphery so first of all we have to see the chest trachea that is the air pipe the wind pipe or air pipe the trachea that is being centered and it uh, seen mostly towards the right side of the midline somewhat towards the right side of the midline not in the midline then comes the its bifurcation that is called carina it's bifurcating into two the right main bronchus and left main bronchus and uh, beside the trachea there comes the aorta that is yellow labeled and the then comes the uh, esophagus but that's that lies posterior and usually on the chest x ray you are unable to uh, unable to identify the uh, esophagus next please now here uh, a very important sign that is if you see the trachea in your on your right hand side and on the left hand side what's going wrong anybody can write in the chest chat box what's going wrong on the second slide as already written there anyone voluntarily medial sternal widely yeah thank you so basically what happened there is uh, th this is called paratracheal strip so normally the paratracheal strip it should be about 2 mm 1 or 2 mm but here what happened there is a lumpy bumpy configuration of the widening of the paratracheal strip on either aspect there is a lumpy bumpy configuration actually uh, uh, i don't have any cursor otherwise i will uh, i will uh, tell you uh, from a marker so basically uh, there is a lumpy bumpy configuration on either aspect of the trachea that is most likely secondary to the lymphadenopathy and in, uh, in our routine practice we are dealing with the viral infections the tuberculosis and the lymphoma most of the time next please so remember the rule that uh, the paratracheal strip should be 1 or 2 mm not more than that if there is some filling in then you can uh, raise the suspicion of lymphadenopathy then comes about the uh, cardiomediastinal contour in which include the heart and the hilar the right right heart border is formed by the right ventricle uh, and the right atrium the left heart border is formed by the left ventricle the both hyla composed of the pulmonary vasculature including the pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein so the thing is that the pulmonary both hyla they should be uh, they should show a finger like projection in which there is a central concavity if this concavity turned out to be a convexity then you label it as a hyalur prominence which may be due to underlying mass or maybe due to the lymph node so this concavity must be maintained just remember that next please 
So this was the hilar point which I was talking about. This is the concavity in an inverted C-shaped configuration. Next, please. So here, what's going on again? It's very clear and crisp. There is the left hilar bulky. So this is obviously left hilar mass. Next, please. So don't forget to uh, comment upon the bones. Always check your bones as they are review areas because the bones are showing the fractures. Sometimes the bone have a bone have a metabolic conditions like rickets. You will see the metaphyseal widening. You will see the different amount of uh, non-accidental injuries. So always go and check your bones as a review areas. Next, please. The scapula is also a very important landmark uh, in uh, reviewing the chest X-ray. Here you are not dealing with the uh, chest X-ray only with the lung field, but also the uh, bones as well. Next, please. So this is a very beautiful example of the distal clavicle fracture. Next, please. So this is a thoracic scoliosis and uh, you need to check your vertebra, whether they are appropriately aligned, the disc spaces are intact or they are showing up paravertebral spinal margins, the lines are intact or not. Because if, if uh, sometimes the hidden tuberculosis, the port's spine, you have to pick on the chest x-ray. Because uh, if, if you deadly, if you miss this, then it's very deadly for the patient. So always you are not having familiar with the MRI. So you need to check for each and every alignment, certain fractures, the wedge compression fractures, you may miss. So always it's your duty to check the vertebra. So here uh, you are dealing with thoracic scoliosis. Look at the concavity. There's a concave configuration of the dorsal spine and in which the concavity is facing towards the left side with obliquity of the ribs. This is called crowding of the ribs. Next, please. So here are your review areas before labeling the chest X-ray as normal. Always check and trace the hyla. Always check the uh, pieces behind the heart and under the diaphragm. Next. Next, please. So here, what, what's, what's the indication? Anyone? What's going wrong? Air under the diaphragm. Air under the diaphragm. Excellent. So this is again a very surgical emergency. Again, a very important uh, point not to be mistaken by any clinician in any exam scenario because it's very important. And uh, honestly speaking, if you if you fail to pick this pathology and the examiner is straightforward, um, straightforward getting very annoyed because it's a very uh, emergency situation. You need to refer this patient uh, on an urgent basis to the surgical department because it's a uh, emergency again. So always check below the diaphragm, whatever is going there, what's wrong is going there. Uh, though the chest x is absolutely completely normal in this scenario. Next, please. So here, what's going wrong? Anyone in the first Pneumothorax. picture? Yes, which kind of pneumothorax is this? Tension pneumothorax. No. On right side, on right side, the both pictures on, on one side, there is tension pneumothorax on another side, there is no, non-tension pneumothorax. So how would you differentiate between two? What's the difference? Yeah, it's spontaneous. That's great. So what's the difference between two? When you will call it as tension? Shifting is the mediastinal the shifting? Tension. Is the mediastinal shifting is the reason? Anyone? Actually, thing is that the tracheomediastinal shift is not the reason to call it as tension. It's basically the diaphragmatic cellar. Now look at the diaphragm. What's going on here on the on the right hand side? The diaphragm cellar is very normal. So we are not going to label it as tension pneumothorax. On the contrary, on the uh, left-hand side, the diaphragm is flattened. So whenever the diaphragm is flattened, you have to call it a, a upfront tension pneumothorax. 
So what's the duty of the radiologist? What's the duty of clinician? What would you do? Urgently refer this case to the surgical department or you can put an intracostal drain in mid clavicular line in second intracostal space. So it's a very, very emergency situation. So don't try to miss it. It's very important because it's, it, can, it can threaten the patient's condition. Next, please. Next. Now uh, we have, so far we have done through the technical factors, the anatomy, and uh, now we are going into diff totally different zone that is common chest emergencies. Next, please. So here, what's going on? This is a chest X-ray, the supine view. Here, the lung, lung is displaced towards medially. The chest tube is seen, the intercostal drain is seen, which is not appropriately positioned. There is flattening of the diaphragm. Here, you check the diaphragm. The diaphragm is being flattened and the pleural cavity is totally filled with a large amount of air. And there is a squeezing of the heart and cardiomediastinal contour towards the contralateral side. There is a significant amount of the mediastinal shift. What else? What else is there? Beside pneumothorax, what else? There are two important things are going on there. Anyone? I will encourage the audience participation because it's very important if you are getting the point or not. No, no pneumopericardium. Excellent, excellent. So is this a pick line or something else? You are close enough. So this is a ETT. This is an ETT. So it's a duty of a clinician to check whether this ETT is appropriately positioned or not. Here it is an, it's a well satisfactory position because sometime what happened, ETT is displaced too far down. So what happened? It can lead to the, it can lead to the complications. It can lead to the lung collapse. So it's our duty to tell the clinician or it's our duty to tell, inform the, our seniors, colleagues that uh, this line or tube is misplaced. So you need to manipulate it on an urgent basis. Another line is sitting there, that is UVC line, umbilicus venous catheter, that is lying over here, this one, okay? Yeah, left side collapse is because of stension pneumothorax, because the heart is squeezing, the heart is going to squeeze this heart, uh, sorry, the lung, the right lung is squeezing the heart, and this is the left lung, this is all collapsed just because of this, uh, just because of this, uh, tension pneumothorax. So patient is in a uh, surgical emergency. This is again an emergency situation. Next, please. So uh, another thing is important whenever you are uh, in uh, doubt so that there is pneumothorax or not. So what will you do? You have to go with the left lateral decubitus uh, chest x-ray. You have to keep the patient on the left lateral side just uh, stay for a few minutes so that air will raise up and then shoot the x-ray. So in this way, you will confirm that air is there or not. So let's assume if, if, you, are, if you are thinking about this x-ray, what's going on here? This is the lung. This is the right lung. And th this is all air which is going towards the medially. This is all air which is going medially. And if you trace the right heart border, it's very sharp. Because of air contrast, the right heart border is very sharp. Here you see, the right heart border is very sharp. And uh, when you confirm it on the left lateral decubitus view, this view, the second view, what happened? The uh, air is being uh, air is being accumulated on the right side under the right uh, lateral abdominal wall, the right lateral chest wall, and between the lung itself. So here is a huge amount of air. So in this way, you can confirm by just merely a simple view, by just changing the position of the patient. So if you are, whenever you are in a, uh, like in, in, in a very vague position, upper right, middle lobe. Sorry, I'm not getting your question.
upper right middle lobe basically this is all lung this is this is the whole lung this is their whole lung so you can't say that this, this is a right middle lobe or not next please so this is again another surgical emergency that is pneumomediastinum so what's going wrong that this is a normal thymus that is being elevated and outlined by an abnormal air you can't see the normal air the abnormal air outlining the thymus in this way in a normal child so this is uh, giving a very famous that is a uh, spinnaker cell sign it's just like an spinnaker sign the air is outlining the very sharp edges of the thymus here comes the thymus which are outlined by these both arrow the thymus is a normal uh, tissue that is being seen in a neonat in a very large uh, sizes while um, they become uh, less um, less bulky and they become very uh, reduced in size in subsequent age groups like in adult you hardly see any or barely see any thymus thymic tissue so here uh, the uh, air is outlining the thymic tissue that is uh, again a very characteristic sign of the pneumomediastinum next please so here again i have uh, kept the three slides for you one uh, we are starting from on the right side uh, that this slide is very dirty as you see the air is outlining the uh, pericardium air is outlining into the uh, interstitium air is hello am i audible yes ma'am okay so air is uh, traversing into the interstitium the pulmonary hyla and around the heart here if you see this is all air this is all abnormal air which is streaking into the interstitium into the neck here you can see the abnormal air here the subcutaneous emphysema so all air this air is very abnormal air so here you can see this is the sign these are the signs of pneumomediastinum uh, on the left hand side in, in the central uh, image again this is the same air that is being traversing the intramuscular planes and this is the axial section taken from the ct scan examination the air is outlining the arch of aorta the air is outlining the trachea this is the trachea and the esophagus so this is uh, sure short signs of the pneumomediastinum again a surgical emergency you need to look for the ct on the ct examination you need to confirm that is it spontaneous or is it due to the uh, positive pressure ventilation or due to the uh, rupture of any viscous next please so this is this is the pneumopericardium someone uh, right right uh, someone wrote it down uh, in earlier slide about the pneumopericardium so this is the pneumopericardium basically what happened the air is confined within the pericardial sac itself it's not going outside that's why we can label it as a neuro pneumopericardium if this air is leaked into the adjacent interstitium or the soft tissues or the root of the hilum of the lung then we call it, call it as a pneumomediastinum rather than pneumopericardium here you can see it's very confined it's confined within a sac sac like structure so this is again a surgical emergency because it causes the tamponade effect on the heart it reduces the ejection fraction reduces the venous return so You, again it's a very emergent situation next please next please can you please remove these annotations so now we are uh, going into a different zone again uh, it's a very common to find a foreign body aspiration in a child uh, as you are dealing with in a routine clinical practices that patients are coming in with a cough and a non uh, non healing infections despite taking antibiotics they are coming on routine basis and even the patients uh, parents are not aware whether patient has uh, aspirated any foreign body or not so uh, always you have you need to evaluate those patients on the chest x ray so the thing is that the most striking feature what is the most striking feature can anyone tell me on this particular x ray hyperinflation hyperinflation 
हाइपर इन्फ्लेशन और हाइपर ट्रांस रेडियंसी ओके नाउ या एक्सीलेंट सो वी नीड टू ना फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वी जस्ट लेट मी करेक्ट यू what is uh, the term hyper inflation and what is the term hyper trans radiancy hyper trans radiancy means more lucent more black one lung is more blacker than other and there are reduced vasculature if you compare the vasculature the vessels between the two lungs what's going on on the right hand side the lung is very black and there are scarce amount of vessel no vessels at all are visualized or very few very scant while on the left side there are normal vascularity so for uh, as far as the um, hyper um, inflation is concerned if you going to uh, count ribs 3 4 5 6 7 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 so it's equal so it's equal on both sides so it's not hyper trans uh, hyper inflated to call it hyper inflated you must have nine anterior ribs on both sides it's not hyper inflated it's just a hyper trans radiant lung the one lung is more blacker on left how would you confirm that patient has having a foreign body or is it just due to rotation how will you confirm anyone expiratory firm which process expiratory film excellent excellent so do you think we can uh, do an expiratory film on the pediatric patient patient is uh, crying and the patient is very irritative and coughing and parents are very vigilant so what do you do uh, you will you have you, you you just ask your radiographer that uh, go and do uh, expiratory view so radiographer is going and ask asking that um, uh, please expire the patient is not able to follow here you are how how you how will you proceed any other view which can help you excellent fizasha excellent that is decubitus view again it's the same as we just we just did in the pneumothorax just to confirm the pneumothorax the same view will be we will do next please i will show you how can we confirm next please yeah this is uh, the foreign body may be opaque or may be radio lucent in prior scan it was radio lucent here it is radio opaque foreign body it's very clear and very metallic density is sitting there so often the patient uh, are usually having the batteries uh, batteries which we are using at home next please so there is one uh, important uh, view that is the expiratory view by expiratory view you can easily go and trace whether the air trapping is being going on or not the ball wall phenomena the air, air is being trapping in and it's not getting out so that's the phenomena which is uh, going with the foreign body here if you compare the both sides the right side the right lung what's going wrong that the left lung is collapsed on expiratory view when in the in the slide d the left lung is showing hyperinflation as compared to right side it's because the air is trapping it's it's on the expiratory view it become the more conspicuous it become more blacker rather than collapse as seen on the right side so uh, this is this is the one view next please this is this was the view which i was talking about so here which side is abnormal this is right lateral decubitus view so this one is the right side this one is your right side right and this one is your left side this is heart so here the lung is collapsed so normally lung should be collapsed so this is the normal side this is the foreign body side because what happened the lung is not collapsed lung is retaining its air on the left left, left lateral decubitus usually what happen on the lateral decubitus usually what happen the air should leave the lung whenever the patient is lying down on that particular side air should leave out of the lung but what happened here there is significant retention of air on the contrary air is outside air is expired out so this is the normal lung and this is the lung with the foreign body so in this manner we can easily easily confirm 
Okay, we will discuss the collapse in subsequent slides. Don't you worry about that. Just uh, make and focus uh, on this slide because it's very important. And I usually uh, find it's very difficult for the clinician to pick up the foreign body if it's a uh, non-radio opaque. So uh, you, in this manner, the, if you go just for a decubitus view on that particular view, that let's assume on the uh, on an AP view, if you are suspecting the foreign body on the right side, just patient uh, do the patient to lie down on the right side, and if you are suspecting on the left side, just patient lie down on the left side. And in this way, you will confirm your foreign body very easily. Next, please. We will discuss the collapse in the next few slides. So now we are dealing with an another zone that is the pulmonary infections and the radiographic patterns. So pattern recognition is again a very important in X-ray interpretation. So here uh, we are dealing with some tuberculosis pattern, the primary and the post-primary few COVID slides are there, the uh, pneumonia types, the low bar and the bronchopneumonia. So we will discuss in a further slides. Next, please. So these are the uh, common radiologic patterns, the consolidation. In consolidation, what happens? There is a pus that is uh, sitting within the air spaces, the alveoli. So there is an air bronchogram sign. As you all see here, very beautiful, that, that is the air bronchogram sign. This is the air bronchogram sign. Um, I hope uh, everybody is seeing my cursor. So this is the consolidation. Here you are dealing with air bronchogram sign. So basically what's going on, that air is within the bronchi and uh, there's, that is contrasting by outside uh, seen the uh, outside alveoli containing the pus. Then comes the interstitial pattern. Then comes the atelectasis. So this is the lung collapse, which you are talking about. In collapse, you will find the opaque lung, only the portion of the lung that is collapsed, the part of the lung that is collapsed. You will see the complete white out of the lung. So this is the collapse. The mass and nodule, the nodule is we can label it when it is less than three centimeter, while the mass, it is greater than three centimeter to call it a mass. So in this way, you can easily recognize the patterns of the pathology of different infections. Next, please. So the most common causative organism, you all are knowing some bacterial, some viral. Next, please. So here are the patterns. Uh, you must be aware, all are, are, all are aware about the patterns of the pneumonias that are lobar pneumonia, the lobular pneumonia or bronchopneumonia, then comes the interstitial pneumonia. So lobar pneumonia, as the name indicates, it's all, all involved, the consolidation involved, the whole of the lobe. The lobular is a very patchy pattern in which there is a concentric terminal bronchioles are involved, the interstitial in which the air spaces are exempted from the pathology, only that things are accumulated within the interstitium of the lung. Next, please. So all the atypical viral pneumonias, most likely the COVID pneumonias, the respiratory syncytial viruses, and the uh, mycoplasma pneumonia, they tend to get this interstitial kind of pattern. Next, please. So here comes the uh, diagrammatic illustration of the bronchopneumonia and the lobar pneumonia. Here you can see whole of the lobe, the left lower lobe is involved and the contrary in bronchopneumonia, there is a patchy distribution, not the only one lobe. Uh, uh, there is some interven intervening lung parenchyma sparing is also there. Next, please. So this is uh, the pattern of the right lobar pneumonia. Here you can see this is the right horizontal fissure. So what's going on? This is the whole of the consolidation. There is some air bronchogram and it's bounded by the right horizontal fissure. So it's a right upper lobe consolidation. Again, it's a pattern of lobar pneumonia. Same thing is going to be depicted on the lateral view. Here you can appreciate that this is the uh, left, uh, the lobar consolidation. Actually, these lines have been drawn by someone else. Uh, I didn't drew them. Uh, Mr. Adil, can you please remove these annotations? No, ma'am, it cannot be removed by, from my side. Okay. Actually, someone else uh, have drawn these lines. Okay. Next, please. 
So this was classical, right? Upper lobe pneumonia. The most uh, causative organisms are the Staphylococcus aureus. Now here, right, middle lobar pneumonia. Okay, I'm showing you. I have one slide. Uh, so what's going wrong here? Anyone? I have just described. Anyone uh, voluntarily? This is the most classic form of bulging fissure sign. So which organism tends to do that? Any thoughts? No one? Strypto. Uh, it's basically Clepsila and Steph aureus. Yes, Steph aureus. So it's basically Clepsila pneumonia. Uh, they are basically producing a lot of pus. So in a, um, it's a tremendous amount of pus that is being uh, developed from these particular organisms that tends to reside in the right upper lobe. And here what happened, the usually normal fissure is this like this, right? Horizontal fissure is just like that. The right lung have two fissures, the right horizontal fissure and right oblique fissure. It divide lung into three parts. So here what's going on, the fissure has turned in a U-shaped configuration because a lot of pus that has caused this fissure down. So this is classically caused bulging fissure sign. Whenever you see that, this is a classical form of the pneumonia and it's due to the Clepsila pneumonia and Staphylococcus aureus, okay? So you need to check for that. Next, please. Then comes another important sign that is the Sillard sign. By means of this Sillard sign, you can easily localize your pathology. So which part of the lung lobe, which lobe of the lung is involved? As someone just asked about the right middle lobe, whether it's in right lower lobe or whether it's in the left lower lobe or in the lingular segment. So by this sign, you can easily uh, identify. Next, please. So here, a very beautiful description that uh, if the uh, abnormality is within the right um, anterior segment of the right upper lobe, then you have to obscuration, you have seen the obscuration of the right heart border. If the right heart border is being obscured, let's assume this border, you are not seeing this right heart border. Let's assume it's not working for me. It's yeah, uh, just a minute. Let's assume this border, the right heart border is not uh, seen clearly and there is an opacity sitting there. So uh, in this manner, you can easily localize the, where is the pathology. You, you must say that it's in the right middle lobe. If the right lower lobe, if the right uh, aspect of the hemidiaphragm is not well seen, this right hemidiaphragm, you are not able to appreciate because of obesity. Then the pathology is sitting within the right lower lobe. So in this manner, you can localize about your consolidations, about the which part of the lung is being involved. Next, please. So I'm showing you in this, again, this is the description of the head sign. Same. Here you can see this on the first slide, uh, left heart border is not well seen. It's obscured by the consolidation. While on the uh, subsequent slide, what's going wrong? That left heart border is seen very clear and crisp, but the left medial aspect of the hemidiaphragm is not well seen. So here the pathology lies in the left lower lobe. While in the first slide where the left heart border was not seen, the pathology lies in the lingular, lingular segment of the left upper lobe. So in this mm. way, just merely by merely looking at which part is involved, you can easily localize your pathology. Is it clear to everyone? Is it clear? Or should yes, I repeat? Yes, okay, thank you. Okay, let me explain again. Uh, here uh, on the first slide, uh, did you make out the left heart border? Did you make out the left heart border? Please respond so that I may I may go accordingly. In first slide, I'm I'm just using the yellow marker. 
here you see no left hard border is seen it's very obscured by the consolidation so mm. here here it the pathology lies in lingula lingular segment of left upper lobe while here the hard border is fine but the diaphragm is not seen diaphragm is in uh, hazy so here it is in the left lower lobe is it clear now yes by just yes, by just looking at these borders you can localize your pathology where the pathology is sitting without merely looking at the ct just on the x ray you can easily say yeah lingula is upper lobe lingula is a part of left upper lobe okay so in left lung left lung has only one fissure oblique fissure that divides the left lung into two the upper lobe and the lower lobe upper lobe has got the lingula which is an accessory part uh, which is uh, uh, you can equivalent to the right middle lobe next please here you can see in first slide what's going on there is an patchy opacity there is an inhomogeneous opacity that is obscuring the left heart border here left heart border is not seen did you check the left heart border is not there all is obscured so where the pathology left middle yeah lingula lingular segment of the left upper lobe and what's happening over here what's happening over here right heart border is not seen so where is the pathology right, right middle, middle lobe. lobe yeah right middle lobe someone was asking about the right middle lobe consolidation so here it is this is right classical right middle lobe consolidation so in this way you can easily localize on the x ray that where is the pathology sitting what part you are dealing with okay is it clear i hope it could be clear now yes ma'am ne next please okay now another sign that is air bronchogram we have just right lobes divisions yeah yeah sure i can i can just give me a minute uh basically uh thing is that we can uh, can we can we discuss all these questions at the end of the session is it possible or just i i will describe it okay okay thank you next please because there are a lot to teach you that's why i'm i'm saying i have to finish it on time so this is air bronchogram sign so uh, anybody with the diagnosis this is very classical classical appearance of something the person RDS. who are working in, yeah classical it's an rds so here bell shaped chest the shape the volume is again now you before uh, proceeding to any any x ray just make it a habit just to um, count the uh, count your ribs it's it's very important to count your ribs just count this is first rib it's not working again for me i feel very difficult in making annotations just give me a minute no it's not working okay just count the ribs 1 2 3 4 5 yeah excellent so there are five ribs so you do you think this volume is normal do you think is it normal or uh, adequate what do you say five ribs are adequate it's of normal volume no, no. excellent excellent so basically uh, what i said initially that you have to check for the ribs if it's in 6 and 1/2 6.5 or it's in seventh ribs then it's adequate seventh anterior ribs here we are dealing with five ribs only so it's a hypovolemia lung lung is too wide where is the air air is not there is air is only within the bronchi so these bronchi are called air bronchogram these are all the bronchi which are containing the air rest of the alveoli surrounding alveolar are collapsed they are called atelectasis basically they are all collapsed due to reduced sur surfactant due to surfactant deficiency so increase surface tension so they are all collapsed so we have a background nodularity background white opacities in both lungs lung volumes are reduced uh, by merely looking at the ribs we just count in the ribs and we say that the lung volumes are reduced and the, what is the shape of the chest chest is bell shaped because of reduced lung volume and what else we need to check most important thing we need to comment on a very priority grounds 
वॉट शुड वी चेक इसमें हम क्या देते हैं ट्रीटमेंट के लिए अगेन लुक एट द एस नाउ यू हैव टू चेक वेदर इट्स एडिकेटली पोजिशन और नॉट इसका एक आराम से एक बहुत अच्छा सा एक रूल है वो रूल क्या है कि ईटी आपकी क्लेविकल के लेवल पे होनी चाहिए ये कराइना है नजर आ रहा है दिस इज कराइना सो हियर इट शुड बी आइडियली टू पॉइंट फाइव सेंटीमीटर अब द क्राइना ये है एक इंच 2.5 सेंटीमीटर आइडियली इट शुड बी 2.5 सेंटीमीटर अब द क्राइना सो इट इज एन एडिकेटली पोजिशन ईटीटी तो आप इसको आराम से इसको गो हेड कर सकते हैं ओके सो दिस इज अ क्लासिकल केस ऑफ द रेस्पिरेटरी डिस्ट्रेस सिंड्रोम विद एयर ब्रोंकोग्राम साइन नेक्स्ट प्लीज सो हेयर अगेन एन ब्यूटिफुल डेमोन्स्ट्रेशन ऑफ द लोबार नमूनिया इन विच वॉट इज गोइंग रॉन्ग the whole of the left lung including the left upper lobe the lingular segment is being filled by the non homogeneous consolidation or consolidation or opacification with an beautiful air bronchogram the air within the bronchi this is all air within the bronchi the whole of the left lung is filled by the consolidation or the pus and what about the left hemidiaphragm it's normal left hemidiaphragm is the normal so there is no left lower lobe is involved left lower lobe is absolutely fine where is the hard border hard border is not seen so it means lingula is also involved where is the arch of aorta it's not well seen it means the upper lobe is also involved so left upper lobe lingula is involved while the left lower lobe is spared did you get my point here we applied the both signs now we have applied both signs air bronchogram sign as well as we have applied the silhet sign over here okay next someone is writing uh, someone is uh, drawing again please uh, can you please uh, remove them mr adil <coughs> so again is a beautiful description of the air bronchogram here here the bronchi are filled with the air and uh, the the consolidation is surrounding consolidation is giving them the white background so both lungs are uh, completely gone only there is relative preservation of the only there is relative preservation of the right upper lobe and the right lower lobe rest of the lung is completely filled by the consolidation so they are basically the pneumonias they are patterns of the pneumonias and you can you can say them the tb as well you can see in the tb as well but not the cystic fibrosis this is not the classical uh, uh, picture of the cystic fibrosis i will show you later on can you please remove all these screen or reshare the screen again i mean i think i should uh, reshare the screen yeah you can reshare it it would be more better thank you so much next please next so in bronco pneumonia as we yeah it would be i would be grateful uh, if you don't mark please so yeah bronco pneumonia as i've already told you that it's a basically at, at the level of bronchioles it's so bronchioles are very tiny uh, lung units in which there is opacification there is some uh, clogging of the uh, bacterial pus or maybe some uh, other um, uh, interstitial agent so it can lead to some nodular opacity so in bronco pneumonia you may find some linear opacity some nodular opacities the small opacities so in this manner uh, you can easily um, outline the, uh, whether it's uh, here we are dealing with the interstitial pneumonia or the bronco pneumonia or lobal pneumonia so again the pattern recognition is the key if you learn the pattern of the um, x rays that uh, this kind of pattern is seen in this particular organism you will reach up to the diagnosis it's very easy just go uh, go to the next slide please yeah now uh, if you compare uh, these both slides from the previous slides what was the difference here on the first if if you uh, look at the first slide what's here you are dealing with the, these are the multiple nodules by the way 
they are multiple nodules here these are nodules which are coalescing to form the consolidation few of them are uh, smaller few of them are larger here you can see few lines and the coarse nodular opacities some reticulations here again the same pictures the coarse bronchovascular markings these are basically the bronchitis bronchitis is being going on the bronchial markings are so much prominent so much coarsening over there few nodular opacity so this is the pattern of the bronco pneumonia this is totally different from this lobar pneumonia we have just discussed so it can be seen in different uh, viral uh, etiologies mainly next please so this is again the non segmental kind of consolidation some nodular opacities it's the same thing which we have just discussed next please so then comes the interstitial pneumonia basically what happened that uh, lung has got the alveoli snr shadows the alveoli for the uh, lung exchange for the oxygen exchange rest of the uh, the part which is not a part of the exchange system that is called interstitium that is basically the supporting the structure of the lung that contains the lymphatics that contains the venules vessels uh, in between so basically whenever any pathology like interstitial lung disease like covid pneumonia atypical pneumonia the respiratory distress syndrome all these things in, in they tends to accumulate and they tends to involve some certain amount of drugs the inciting agents they tends to involve the interstitium more so they uh, will give you a certain linear opacities rather than will give you the lobar consolidation or the bronco pneumonia pattern next please okay so now here we are dealing with another entity that is the lung abscess as you all are aware about the uh, this kind of pathology that the most of the bacterial organism will give you this kind of appearance the lung abscess mostly it's seen as a fairly well defined cavitatory lesion within the lung and uh, with an air fluid level so you remember that what what's uh, what air do air is very lighter medium it always go up when patient is standing over there so air will go up while the fluid the pus or any debris will go gravitate downward so it will give you an air fluid level in this manner and uh, it's very uh, important to uh, differentiate this lung abscess from the empyema most of the residents most of the uh, clinician always uh, even our radiologist uh, uh, they are very uh, often uh, mistakenly uh, report this lung abscess as an empyema whenever they are huge enough whenever they are very large and they are touching the pleura so it's very uh, difficult uh, by uh, some time to recognize between two so it there is a simple formula if you learn this formula you will never be wrong that is a is equal to b and a, a is not equal to b uh, in case of empyema in case of empyema a not equal to b while in abscess a is equal to b like if you if you give uh, uh, if you see an pathology who is showing the same appearance on ap view and it's also going the same appearance on the same shape on the lateral view it's called a this is b this is a a is equal to b while in empyema it will give you uh, this kind of appearance on the ap view while on um, in this lateral view it will give you this kind of appearance so totally different pattern so in this way you can easily differentiate between the lung empyema and the lung abscess just looking at their shapes and characteristics pattern i hope you get my point if not then you can uh, ask me on the chat next please okay now we are dealing with the tb there are certain uh, tuberculosis uh, patterns that this is a primary tb you usually uh, often uh, see this on in your clinical practice in the form of lymphadenopathy the bone focus then comes the post primary tb it's very uh, devastating kind of pattern uh, in which you can uh, you can see uh, the cavitatory forms most oftenly in the form of the miliary nodules and um, sometimes the bronchiectatic changes so it's a very common here in our setup as well next please so uh, i'm not going into detail about the tb as you are most of you are familiar with this entity next please i'm just showing you the pictures just to save the time so this is uh, again a chest x ray with a patient with the primary tuberculosis here you can see what i what i told you in the earlier just check 
the uh, right paratracheal strip. What was the measurement of the right paratracheal strip? It was merely one or two mm. I told you it just be like that. But here, what's going wrong? This is again, there's a lumpy, bumpy configuration. And again, if you see, we, we were saying that hyla should be like this. Here, what, what happened? Hyla is convex on both aspects. So these all are lymph nodes. Beside that, what's going wrong here? Where is the, this is the left hemidiaphragm. Where is the right hemidiaphragm? Right hemidiaphragm is absent over on right side. So there is a huge collection. There is a huge impyma sitting there. Someone is asking about impyma. So here there, there is impyma on this X-ray, okay? So there are the lymph nodes and there is impyma and the consolidation. So this was a classical appearance of the primary GB. Next, please. The, this is the gone focus. Again, uh, it's a calcified area that is seen in the left hyla. Again, you can uh, easily uh, see this. If, if you trace this hyla, this is the normal hyla. So here the hyla is replaced by a large focus, calcified focus of the lymph node that is called the gone focus. That is a characteristic of the primary TB. Next, please. So this is the cavitatory nodule. If you see there's a central part is the lucent and peripheral part is the uh, dense. So this is the characteristic of the reactivation TB. So reactivation TB is very dangerous. You need to isolate that patient. You need to screen uh, the whole of the TB context in the family as well. So whenever you see any bronchiectatic changes in the upper lobe, and uh, in the uh, with the cavitatory focus specifically, you need to you need to um, screen that patient's family as well. And uh, one more thing which I uh, must emphasize over here that uh, there are posterior segments of the upper lobe and the superior segment of the lower lobes are the most important uh, locations which TB involved because of uh, because it's an aerobe, so it needs oxygen to uh, multiply. So it tends to involve these uh, segments, usually on the HRCT chest, on the CT chest with contrast. We usually, uh, if, if there is involvement of those particular segments, then we will uh, label it as TB. Next, please. So I'm not going into detail in the miliary and uh, other forms of TB as you all are aware about this entity. Next, please. Because we have a lot to deal with. This is a miliary pattern, typically millet seeds, just like pulses. Have you eaten? I think uh, some uh, everyone has uh, taken the pulses in their routine um, diet. So it's it, it resembles um, millet seeds, like appearance, very fine, one to two mm nodules. These are randomly scattered in both lung fields without any zonal predilection. There is no zonal predilection. No zone is exempted everywhere they are seen sitting because it have an hematogenous spread. So wherever the blood go, it tends to spread those. So both of the lungs are uh, involved in all three. So it's again a very uh, contagious kind of thing. Next, please. This is a corona, uh, as you all are aware. Uh, we have recently face, um, faced a very... Um, very uh, dangerous situation in last two years. So um, this is basically, again, uh, what happened. Uh, these are both other HRCT chest uh, scans. And uh, this one is X-ray, so I'm better to define the X-ray first. So what happened on X-ray, there is peripheral opacities. Here, if you see, these are the peripheral inhomogeneous opacities, relative preservation of some part here. The right lower lobe is preserved, right upper lobe is preserved and very hazy, inhomogeneous opacities, but most of these opacities are peripheral. These are just like they are involving the periphery. They are not extending from the hyla. They are not uh, involving the central part. So they are uh, showing an air space pattern. So some uh, coronavirus will show you the interstitial pattern initially followed by the air space pattern. So we labeled them on the HRCT chest as ground glass density. So these are the uh, typical presentation of the HR, uh, uh, HRCT as well as the X-ray uh, de depiction of the coronavirus. Next, please. Here comes another entity that is very important again uh, because it uh, we usually mistaken this as a mass 
because uh, most of you, if you are not familiar with this entity, you can easily misdiagnose it as a mass and uh, it will lead to uh, unnecessary anxiety to the patient. So in children who are less than seven years of age group, what happens there are uh, poor development of the collateral airs uh, drift. So in that way, what happens uh, if, if air is not communicating, there's no collateral air drift. So uh, the consolidation tends to accumulate on the one side. It resembles a coin-like appearance. So that is labeled as round pneumonia. And after eight years of age, when a collateral air drifts are developed, the air airwaves become more mature, then consolidation will give you the low bar kind of pattern, the bronchopneumonia kind of pattern. It will not give you the round pneumonia. So it's very important to be familiar with this entity just to not be mistaken it as a mess. Next, please. Now we are going to discuss a bit about the surgical causes of respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, respiratory distress. Thank you. Next, please. So here, uh, uh, what I told you, you need to uh, locate, uh, uh, localize about the normal anatomy first. So here, which part of the normal anatomy is obscured? Anyone? Left part. Left, left. Diaphragm, left, left. diaphragm, left diaphragm. the right diaphragm is good. Where is the left diaphragm? It's not seen. Left diaphragm is not seen. So what's going on? You need to check this NG, NG tube. It's your duty to first check the lines and tubes. Is there any umbilical artery catheter, umbilical venous catheter, the nasogastric tube, ETT tube? What else the lines are present? You just make sure whether they are appropriately positioned or not. It's your duty always, and it's my duty as well. So you have to check uh, which part of the normal anatomy is missing over there. There's a left hemidiaphragm is not well seen. And a lot of leucencies, the cystic leucencies are seen sitting within the left lung. They are causing the significant contralateral mediastinal shift. And left hemidiaphragm is not seen, though it's most likely secondary to the congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Again, it's a surgical emergency because of mediastinal shift, because of diaphragm uh, compression. So we have to rush to the surgical department. One more thing, what else we can give as a differential in this case? Anything congenital else? Congenital cystic adenomatoid malformation. Excellent, excellent, CCAM. So basically in CCAM, we have usually three types, the type one and type two. The type two variety is a great mimicker of the congenital diaphragmatic hernia in which we have a macrocyst and uh, we usually due to their bigger size, we are unable to recognize the diaphragm in that particular scenario as well. So that's why it's very important uh, to go for a CT scan just to confirm uh, the exact normal anatomy and the evaluation of certain pathology before uh, going to the surgery uh, plan, like before going for, uh, proceeding for the surgery. Next. This is again an, uh, another surgical emergency that is congenital lobar emphysema. So what happened? There is an extra lobe that is an, an aberrant and anomalous lobe of the lung that has been overinflated. That has been overinflated. Uh, please go back. Please go back. Yeah, so that has been overinflated with the lung, with the air, and it's not um, releasing air on the expiration. So what it causes, it causes the, again, the mediastinal shift and mass effect over adjacent lung parenchyma. It's also causing a uh, mass effect over the left lower lung as well. This is the left normal lower lung, and this is the abnormal lung. So it is pushing not only the, this cardiomediastinal contour, but also it's exerting effect over the left lower lung as well. Here you can easily see the diaphragm. Diaphragm is flattened over there because of mass effect. So uh, if it's causing significant mass effect, then we can uh, deal it uh, with the surgery. We can cause it in the lobectomy. Uh, and if it's completely asymptomatic, it's just an incidental note, then we can uh, let it to the follow-up. The most common location is the left upper lobe followed by the right middle lobe, followed by the right upper lobe, okay? So this is the most common sequence. It's being asked in the MCQs as well. Next, please. 
So here again, uh, we have just discussed about the CCAM, that is congenital cystic adenometroid malformation. There are again multiple multilocated cystic lesion seen sitting the right upper lobe and right mid zone, and it's causing the contralateral mediastinal shift. Here, if you trace the diaphragm, diaphragm is very well seen. Diaphragm is very nicely depicted on both sides. Only you see this lung is abnormal, and this is the normal part of the right lower lobe. So this is the CCAM, classical CCAM. Again, you can go for a CT to further characterize. Next, please. So here, the C this is the axial and the coronal sections of the CT scan. The very beautifully uh, depicted depiction of the multi-loculated cystic areas, which are air-filled, they are producing the exerting the mass effect over the trachea and the mediastinum as well. Next, please. This is type two variety, by the way. Am I audible? Yes, Hello? Okay, someone yes, is saying no voice. So these are the 3D images uh, from the CT scan. Again, uh, these are uh, showing you the CCAM type 2. Next, please. This is the most common variety type 2. So that's why we are having uh, much more. So whenever you are getting a history of repeated uh, chest infection in a patient, despite having multiple uh, um, admissions and multiple times of antibiotics, patient is having again and again fever and respiratory tract infections. So what you are thinking of in that particular scenario? Cystic fibrosis. Okay, excellent. What else? I need your participation, please. If you are going to participate, it would be uh, great for me as well because it will give me that's whatever you I'm getting, telling you, you are getting me or not. Yeah, foreign body. Yeah, CCAM, excellent CCAM. Anything, anything particular. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, dyskinesia. Sorry. Immunodeficiency. Yeah, excellent. Immunodeficiency. But here, what is written on the slide? Excellent. Sequestration. Sequestration, you need to think of this. In sequestration, you will get the typical, typical history of the repeated chest infections in the person. So on x-ray, it's extremely difficult. Even we people, we radiologists usually tend to miss this in our routine practice. So what's going on in, the, in this particular chest x-ray? Actually, uh, there is some background voice. Can you please mute them off? Thank you. Yeah, sequestration, most common age. Basically, we have two kinds of sequestration, the intralobar variety and extralobar variety. So an intralobar variety is uh, usually we will get in the adult population, like in 16 years, 18 years, 20 plus, in which they tend to produce with the repeated chest infection. And usually uh, they are uh, not being uh, diagnosed till that age. While the extra lobar variety is, it will present in the neonatal period uh, with uh, different kind of associations, uh, some diaphragmatic associations, some vertebral kind of associations, congenital heart diseases. So it, it will uh, manifest in the earliest period of the life. So uh, the most common appearance on the chest X-ray how will you how will you trace it? It's very difficult. I told you about the review areas in my initial part of the talk that you never Threatening. forget to yeah sorry flattening of diaphragm yeah flattening but here diaphragm is okay. Do you think diaphragm is uh, flattened here? Diaphragm is okay. Now just look, have a look on the first slide. Diaphragm is very okay. So there is basically you need to check behind the heart. This is your review area. Whenever you see completely normal x-ray, it's your duty to check your review areas behind the apex, both apex, both hyla, below the diaphragm and behind the heart. So is there something behind the heart? Is there something behind the heart? There is a density sitting behind the heart. So this is the sequestration on particular CT. You can see there is a vessel that is arising from the aorta and it's uh, draining, it supplying this particular sequestration. So basically sequestration, what is that? That is a, an anomalous part of the lung that is supplied by a different uh, um, pleural covering. It's getting its arterial supply from the aorta while it's draining. It's uh, uh, all the blood 
to the systematic as well as pulmonary in extra lobar variety it is draining into the systematic uh, venous system while in intra lobar variety it's a part of the lung so it will drain into the pulmonary vein so that's the basic difference between two so here uh, on the ct scan uh, if you see this is the aorta this is the aorta and this is the vessel which is supplying this anomalous part of the lung so he, this is the retrocardiac uh, opacity which you need to look for if you miss this completely and it's it's very very difficult uh, to pick on the x-ray un unless you will not follow the uh, particular review areas which we just just described that we have to check our review areas so behind the heart uh, is our review area next please next yeah this is another sequestration this is the multiple intensity projection here you can see there is a vessel is being supplying the um, the sequestration sequestered part uh, from the aorta yeah it's very difficult it's often missed by an experienced radiologist so always always uh, get your habit to check behind the heart you will get the left lower lobe collapse you will get uh, hidden consolidations you will get the sequestration behind the heart these all three entities you will get there so it's your duty to go and check behind the heart next please so um, the lung volume evaluation we have just did that we have to count the anterior ribs we have looked at the diaphragm now look uh, in what uh, what happened in the first x-ray there is the first third and fourth ribs uh, you you see up to the uh, if you count the ribs only the fourth ribs are there so this is an expiratory view and in the mid part of the central part of the x-ray here if you if you are going to count the ribs again uh, how much ribs one two three four five five and six six uh, partial is coming so it's an inspiratory view and here if it's greater than seventh ribs then you can cause it air trapping and here there is flattening of the diaphragm as well if you see there is a widening of the intercostal spaces as well if you compare both from this lung so in this way you can evaluate the lung volume whether the lung volume is adequate whether the lung volume is normal or where the lung volume is over inflate as someone said earlier that this is over inflated so this in this way you can easily say and third thing you need to look at the heart so in, as in, in the first x-ray, where is the heart? Heart is going below the diaphragm. Here, if you, if you see, the heart is going where? Heart is going below the diaphragm. While in the next, heart is touching the diaphragm. While in the third part, heart is above the diaphragm. So in, uh, by just counting the uh, ribs, by just looking at the heart shadow, by just uh, making the shape of the diaphragm, you will reach up to the lung volume evaluation in this way very easily. Next. So here, these are the medical causes of the respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, initially, we discussed about the respiratory distress syndrome. Now there is a meconium aspiration syndrome. As you all are aware about the uh, meconium aspiration syndrome that it's seen in the post trum babies due to gasping and due to uh, meconium aspiration, there is chemical pneumonitis going on within the lung that can lead to a lung collapse, the atelectasis and subsequent air trapping. So here, um, again, you have to check the lung volumes first by counting the ribs. This is the first ribs, second rib, third rib, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. Now we have got the eight ribs anteriorly. So this is the increased lung volume. This is the increased lung volume. So in increased lung volume, what uh, you have to think of two things. Like it can be due to neonatal pneumonia or it can be due to the meconium aspiration syndrome. If the patient is post-term clinically in the history the, and uh, lung have a lot of creepy, ropey kind of opacities, they have subsegmental atelectasis, like some sort of white and black areas, then you think of the meconium aspiration syndrome. And if you see any effusion, then you have to think and patient is septicemic or toxic clinically and patient have raised ESR and the clinically markers, lab markers, then you think of the uh, infection like neonatal pneumonia. Next. I hope uh, it's e uh, now easy for you to count the ribs. Now, this is again the same picture, um, intubated patient here, NG tube is seen satisfactorily positioned, both lung volumes reduced. If you count the ribs, only one, two, three, four, five, six ribs are there. 
hardly and there is a diffuse reticular shadowing the diffuse haziness seen in the both lungs and the, there is obscuration of the hard borders you barely see any hard border where is the right hard border where is the left hard border you can't see and there is air bronchogram sign which we just did in the last slides so this is a classical form of the rds one more thing which you can see that um, this is mostly seen in the preterm babies so you have to check for the epiphysis of the humeri you have to check for the here you can see about the epiphysis of the humeri epiphysis is absent which is seen in the uh, term babies so it is a preterm baby most likely next please so this is again an rds uh, with a complication so in rds we are having uh, these patients are usually on the mechanical ventilation so they tends to develop the pneumomedial sternum pneumothorax so here patient is having the pneumothorax on the left side with contralateral mediastinal shift so this is the collapsed part of the lung here if you see this is the collapsed part of the lung and this is the air this is the air and this is heart shadow so it, this all whole of the right lung is abnormal multiple cystic lucencies air bronchogram and the hazy haziness this haziness we can call this a ground glass we can call this a reticular nodular shadowing so it's a classical uh, rds with a complication yeah next please so this is a transient tachypnea of the newborn again a um, very common thing usually seen in a patients with the cesarean sections who are delivered with the cesarean sections due to retained amount of free fluid and it's a self limiting condition usually it will um, it will uh, completely resolve by end of 24 hours so the only thing you can see this is a normal size normal uh, adequate volume lung and you will only see about the this uh, perihilar opacities like subtle perihilar uh, very fine uh, opacities you can see on the um, in in the lung otherwise the lung is okay you can just see here there are fine perihilar opacities the linear markings and the lung volume is absolutely normal so it is self limiting condition uh, it will resolve by its own next so this is the cystic fibrosis typical cystic fibrosis someone was asking about the cystic fibrosis so basically what's uh, going on in cystic fibrosis there are bilateral segmental and central uh, bronchiectatic changes so here are the trametric shadowing basically the cystic and the trametric shadowing as are going on in the lung in both upper lobes if you see there are uh, just like these shadowing there are peribronchial thickening and the shadowing here if you see these are the shadowing these are originating from the hyla going in the upper right upper lobes and moreover there are certain linear shadowing more the nodular shadowing some opacifications and uh, bulky hyla are also there which is due to the pulmonary arterial hypertension in addition to that are you noticing this thing what is that anyone what is this what is this tube anyone can tell me this tube which thing is this permaket excellent so why we are giving this to this uh, cf patients so it's basically we are using it for the those patients who are on the prolonged chemotherapeutic agents like in cystic fibrosis or in patients who are having lung transplantation or patient who are having uh, any cancer or any uh, disabling condition which needs prolonged medication so this is a permaket so here we can uh, check the permaket tip as well whether it's pr uh, present at a normal cavo atrial junction or not so here it is appropriately positioned we need to check for that also and uh, if you notice there are subcutaneous emphysema as well because the chest strain is there so there is a pneumothorax have you noticed about the pneumothorax anyone how many of you noticed this is the lung so this is all free air have you noticed no vessel there beyond this level this is a pleural nine yeah left upper lobe there is a pneumothorax and there is a tube uh, intercostal drain is being placed there subcutaneous emphysema in the left lateral chest wall so all these are the um, cause and effect of this particular intervention so this is a classical case of the pneumothorax uh, cystic fibrosis next please 
Yeah. Now coming to a different zone that is a, a bit about the cardiology. I haven't put any uh, uh, more slides, only few slides just for the examination sec. So this is a classical, uh, the bottle appearance, or you can say box shaped heart, very famous for what? Epstein anomaly. So basically what happened whenever your right atrium, whenever your right atrium is enlarged, it always go in this direction right atrium and the left atrium will also go in in this direction both will go in, the, in this direction and left ventricle will go in this direction or oh, sorry right ventricle will go in this direction right ventricle and right when uh, left ventricle will go below the diaphragm here in this so by just looking at the shape of a heart you can easily uh, say about the which part of the uh, heart chamber is enlarged so here the drastic enlargement of the right atrium so basically, this is Epstein anomaly. Yeah, you can see such kind, such picture in case of cardiomyopathies and the pericardial effusion, in which we can uh, call it as a, a flask shaped heart as well. Next, please. Next is echo, and you have to confirm this on the echo echocardiography. This is classical. Which sign is this? Eight shaped heart or snowman, snowman. heart? Yeah, snowman heart. So what's going on? Figure there is. Eight figure of eight appearance because of a large vein that is anomalous vein that is being draining into the right uh, sub SVC uh, and that's crossing the midline and it's draining into the right SVC and it's making a, another contour on the left side and this is the right side, this is a SVC, this is the anomalous vein which is draining. So it is giving you the classic eight shaped configuration or the snowman configuration. That is a very classical form of the, which variety? Supracardiac variety of the total anomalous pulmonary venous return. It, it has got three varieties, supracardiac, cardiac, and infracardiac. The most common is supracardiac variety and its supracardiac variety will give you this kind of characteristic picture on the X-ray. Otherwise on other, other, other varieties, you can't uh, see such uh, classical form on the x-ray only the echo will tell you the detailed report next please this is a very famous classical uh, tetralogy of follet here there are four components as i told you that uh, the left ventricle whenever it enlarges, the left ventricle will go in this way in this manner it will elevate this is the sorry right ventricle the right ventricle will go up and and it will give you an upturned uh, appearance this is the uh, right atrium and left ventricle will always go down. So here, nothing to deal with the uh, left ventricle. The right ventricle is uh, enlarged and it's go there. It will give you a classical boot shape configuration. There is right-sided aortic arch. Here you can't find any aortic arch uh, as normally seen over here. And uh, you will get the pulmonary oligemia. If you see, notice the where are the vessels. There are no vessels in in this uh, X-ray, particular X-ray, there are a very scant amount of vessels. So this is classical, uh, the cyanotic form, which uh, oligmic lung field. So always, whenever you see the classical boot-shaped appearance, always check the lung field. Lung field uh, is scant of vessels or lung field is of normal vessels. So this is a classical pulmonary oligemia. Moreover, if you consider about the, this here, this is the normal location of the aorta. Uh, here, pulmonary bay is also inverted. Pulmonary bay is also uh, not very well seen. Uh, let me draw this. Normally, in left heart border, uh, you will find, you will find two bumps on left side. You will find this, this is aorta. This is pulmonary trunk. But what happened there, here is aorta on the right side, this, uh, in spite of left side normally, and the, pulmon uh, aort and the pulmonary trunk is showing concave bay. Normally it should be a convex bay because there is pulmonary obstruction. There is small pulmonary annulus, pulmonary obstruction is there. That's why it will not give you the normal pulmonary convexity, rather it will give you the concavity. 
and the moreover the aorta normal here it will present over here now it is shifting towards the right side that is association seen into the 30 percent of the cases of the tetralogy of follet so always check the position of the heart on the x-ray always check the pulmonary corners always check this boot shape configuration and the pulmonary polygemia these four components you should check and advise echo in this particular scenario so which is the commonest method to treat this which shunt anyone bt shunt yes pelalog tossing shunt next please next next So uh, now we are dealing with uh, something about the abdomen, uh, that congenital high bowel obstruction and we have having the congenital low bowel obstruction because, because of time constraints, I will uh, review it in a very quick manner. Please next. So congenital uh, high bowel obstruction, there are few things which you are noted upon that uh, there is a esophagus atresia with a distal tracheosophageal fistula. So it's a very important to find out uh, such entity in a child uh, who is presented with a drooling, with a, a choking and with a sinus-like uh, conditions. Uh, the most important thing uh, which we can pick on the x-ray that is the curling of the NG tube when um, inability to pass the NG tube clinically or on the x-ray there is the cur curling or uh, incurving of the NG tube. Moreover, if you see the distal air, now you have to trace the there is distal air present or not. If there is distal air, it means there is distal fistula. If there is no air, it means there is only atresia, only atresia. Okay, so you have to check whether, whether there is distal air or not. So if there is no air distally, it means there is either the proximal fistula or there is only atresia, isolated atresia. So these two entities can be possible if there is no air distally. Next, please. So here, this is the most common type that is a proximal esophageal atresia and distal tracheosophageal fistula in which you can see the distal air and the proximal incurving of the NG tube. And uh, you may have uh, no fistula at all, only the bilateral atresia, upper and lower aspect. You may have a proximal tracheosophageal fistula and distal atresia. Or you may have uh, both fistulas like N variety, N type variety in which there is air seen distally. Next. Next, please. Yeah, this is the most common double bubble sign of the duodenal atresia. So what, what happened? Patient really present with the bilious vomiting. So you need to characterize when a patient is dealing with the vomiting, you are uh, presenting with the patient who have a vomiting. Always ask, ask the question whether patient have a uh, bilious vomiting or a non-bilious vomiting. If it's a bilious vomiting, then it means the obstruction or any problem that is lying beyond the ampulla of water. So you are dealing with the junction of the um, foregut and the midgut. So, so you, you have your differentials will curtain down to a different arena. While if the patient is having a non-bilious vomiting, then you are playing on a different zone. So in duodenal atresia, there is a classical on X-ray. There is a double bubble configuration. There is a one bubble of the uh, one bubble of the uh, stomach, another bubble of the uh, duodenum. Rest you can't see any air. Uh, there is only gasless abdomen distally. So this is called a duodenal atresia. If you see a minimal amount of the gas distally, then it can be due to the duodenal narrowing. It can be due to the duodenal web, or it can be due to due to the lead band or malrotation. So if, but only in duodenal atresia, you will not get, get any kind of gas distally. So this is a classical examination case, duodenal atresia in 30% of cases, it is associated with the Down syndrome. So you need to look for the ribs always, always count the ribs, whether there are 13 pairs or 11 pairs, because it is associated with the duodenal atresia in those particular patient. Next, please. So a bit about the malnutrition, we are not going into detail because time has approached. Next, please. Yeah, so this is a particular uh, case which we are dealing with now on X-ray. If you see, there is a significant amount of distension of the, uh, of the stomach here, but you barely see a gas in the, uh, in the jejunum. 
uh, this is a jejunum, this is a duodenum, but here uh, no gas at all, only a smaller amount of the gas lying over there. So uh, again, uh, on the basis of X-ray, we can't we can't say this is due to malrotation. We just say this is a non-specific kind of uh, gas pattern on the X-ray, but only the um, uh, stomach is significantly distended. So it means there is some outlet obstruction seen at the level of uh, distal stomach or maybe a proximal duodenum. But uh, we can't say anything uh, beyond that. It may be due to duodenal obstruction. But uh, what's the reason? We can't say. So we need to confirm it on the upper GI study. So in the subsequent upper GI study, if you follow and trace it, there is a uh, contrast is uh, filling and opacifying. We have given through the NG tube and uh, contrast is filling the stomach. This is the antrum, <laughs> pylorus, first part of the duodenum, second C loop of the duodenum, but it should, normally it should cross the midline. This is the L1 level. This is the transpyloric plane. The uh, Sorry, this is the transpyloric plane. So normally this uh, DJ junction, it should be cross the midline. It should reach up to here on the right, uh, on the left side. But what's going on? It's not crossing the midline while it's also screwing and it's making a cork screw pattern over here. So it means there is uh, evidence of the malrotation up, uh, in addition to the uh, volvulus. So the volvulus is going on. And uh, same description is going on the subsequent image that it's not crossing the midline. If you, if you see and check this uh, vertebra, this vertebra is the central part. Here it's not crossing the midline, it's uh, remain on the right side. So it's some classic malnutrition with the uh, volvulus, mid-gut volvulus. So again, it's an emergency and patient should be urgently referred to the surgical department. Next patient. Next, please. Yeah, this is the classical whirlpool sign, which we see on the ultrasound. Uh, if you are uh, not sure on if you are having some theory on the basis of the upper GI study, you can easily go and check the patient on the ultrasound in which the SMV, the superior mesenteric vein, normally it should be on the right side. Here, the superior mesenteric vein, it crosses towards the left side and aorta SMA on the right side. There is a classical reversal of SMA and SMV uh, appearance. So this is a classical whirlpool sign. You can see there's a swirling of the vessel going on. Okay. There's a classical swelling. Next. So this is a triple bubble appearance of the jejunal atresia. Again, it's an emergency. If you uh, go and focus this, there is a one bubble that is a stomach. There is a duodenum and this is a jejunum, but no gas distally. Here you can't see, can't appreciate any gas. So it's a gasless abdomen distally. So it's a classical form of the jejunal atresia. Again, upper GI study would be the confirmatory. Next, please. Congenital lower bowel obstruction, again, it's very important and in, in which we have a classical history of unable to pass meconium. It may, normally, meconium should be passed within 48 hours from the birth. But if it's not passing, the patient is not passing any meconium, then we are suspecting some abnormality. Now, we, here, we, are, we have five entities which can we think of in case of congenital low bowel obstruction. Next, please. So in, these include the ileal atresia, meconium ileus, meconium plug syndrome, Hirschsprung disease, anorectal malformation, imperforate NS. Uh, apart from all five, the imperforate NS we usually seen uh, at the bioclinical examination, while rest of the things we can confirm on the X-ray and subsequent radiological modalities. Next, please. So here uh, you are dealing with ileal atresia. So uh, it's very uh, important uh, to check uh, of the congenital low bowel obstruction on the X-ray. X-ray is very, very important. And it's very uh, easy to uh, say about the low bowel obstruction. You just see the where gas is lying down. So uh, in the um, uh, up to 24 hours of the time, uh, usually uh, the neonates having the uh, air within the gut. Uh, by 24 hours, it should reach up to the rectum. But here, what's going on? Uh, in, in here, you can't see any gas. You can't see any gas in the rectum and the distal sigmoid colon. You can't see. You only see the gas up to here. 
in this part of the uh, bowel and above part of the bowel, but here can't. So this is the classical low bowel obstruction. So whenever you see the gas in the central part of the abdomen and that there is no gas in distally, you always uh, ask the question about the low, uh, raise the question about the low bowel obstruction. So in low bowel obstruction, you have to check for the ileal atresia, for the meconium mileus, for the hush sprung or any anorectal malformation. For that, the lower bowel and enema, bowel enema, uh, small, uh, sorry, uh, large bowel enema is the confirmatory. So here on the large bowel enema, you can see the contrast is outlining the descending colon. It can reach up to the sigma, uh, transverse colon. This is the sigmoid colon. Um, and uh, this is the um, uh, splenic flexure. And this is the ascending colon. This is the cecum. Now it's uh, up to the, yeah, this is the uh, terminal ileum. But uh, where is the uh, rest of the small bowel? It's not there. So it means there is atresia. It, there is completely blind ending, cut off, ab absolutely ab abrupt cut off the small bowel. So and contrast is not going beyond that. Ideally, it can. So this is the classical uh, appearance of the ileal atresia. Again, it's a surgical emergency and patient is urgently referred to the surgery. Next. So here again, uh, next please. Yeah, again, we are dealing with the meconium ileus. So it's very important to differentiate between the meconium ileus and the ileal atresia because ileal atresia, it's a surgical procedure management while meconium ileus is a conservative management in which we can only give the hyper, uh, saline, uh, hypertonic saline. We can just pass and all the meconium will pass away and the uh, obstruction is relieved. So again, it's very important to uh, justify between the two diagnoses. So here again, uh, you see uh, this uh, chest uh, this abdominal x-ray so uh, the gas is seen within the abdomen and there is a scant amount of or almost no gas seen in the rectum so when you give the a contrast enema this is a rectum sigmoid colon again what happened this is a splenic flexure transverse colon so what going on this is a micro colon the colonic caliber should be bigger but here the colonic caliber it's very small it's very narrow it's a ribbon like colon so it's labeled as micro colon it's unused colon so what happening uh, it's going there it's going up to the small bowel as well the appendix is very well outlined but there are multiple meconium pellets if you go and press it these white areas the white areas these are the meconium pellets these are multiple meconium pellets and these are the filling defects of the meconium which is thick and tenacious due to cystic fibrosis these kind of patients having underlying cystic fibrosis the chances of cystic fibrosis are high in these patients so that's why that's why these uh, meconium pellets are thick and tenacious they tend to accumulate it within the bowel and tends to obstruct so if you give them the saline, uh, hypertonic saline, you, it will not only, uh, the diagnostic enema is not only the diagnostic, but also it will give you a therapeutic effect. So in this way, you can easily treat this uh, these kind of patients. So again, it's very important to differentiate from the ileal atresia. Next, though the picture is same on the x-ray, as you see. So this is a meconium plug syndrome, also called small left colon syndrome. It's also very functional uh, immaturity, basically, and there is no microcolon. Next, please. So this is a classical Hirschsprung disease. Here uh, you can see there's contrast in seen opacifying the colon and the rectum. But if you see uh, on the anema, the rectum is very small in caliber as compared to the uh, colon. Normally, you may find the rectosigmoid uh, uh, ratio should be greater than uh, 2 into 1. Rectum should be wide caliber. Rectum should be wide caliber and the colon should be small caliber. But here it is inverted. Rectum is very small as compared to colon. So rect ratio become 1 into 2. It's inverted. So this is a classical um, appearance of the Hirschsprung disease on the uh, anema. So uh, in this way, you can uh, easily go for a suction biopsy from that particular segment of a ganglionic segment. Next, this is a lateral view in which you can see there's a smaller caliber of the rectum. And, uh, uh, and you see that uh, there is uh, incoordinate, incoordinate and synchronous movement of the rectum. If you see, there is this is an in, 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 in synchronous movement. This is a no, not the normal peristalsis. Not normal peristalsis, rectum should be this. 
it shouldn't show you the serrated configuration here it's showing you the serrated kind of configuration so it's in, a, in a, it's not a good peristaltic activity so basically it's all because of this a ganglionic segment and there is a huge dilatation of the proximal uh, bowel which is containing a lot amount of the feces and the air and things like that next please So another entity that is necrotizing enterocolitis. So it's again a very severe bowel inflammation and uh, you really seen in the preterm infants and uh, in which there is a very some situation, there is necrosis being going on within the bowel and you may see the intramural air and which can lead to the bowel perforation and uh, pneumoperitoneum. Next. Yeah. So this is uh, again the chest uh, abdominal x-ray in which uh, you can appreciate the air is seen within the bubbly. It is showing a bubbly like lucency and a bubbly configuration within the bowel air uh, wall. <clears throat> uh, can we take a azan break? Uh, I'm thinking. Uh, I'm thinking to um, close the presentation now. Um, just few slides more, so we can do rest uh, in the subsequent sessions if uh, I can. So because it's um, a lot uh, to study more. It's a very vast subject, so I don't think so. In first, in one session, we can cover all of the topic. We have a GU and we have an MSK series. So I think um, it's um, not possible uh, to cover whole things. And it's also for you not to uh, take uh, absorb all the information at once, I think. So what you say, please vote for that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you can arrange an, an, another session for CT scan, MRI, and uh, nephrology uh, uh, related radiology images. Yes. Because um, uh, I uh, mostly I covered the chest today, uh, very few slides of the abdomen and very few uh, negligible amount of the rest of the uh, systems. Because in one presentation, it wasn't possible to cover a lot uh, because radiology is very vast. So nephrology, very uh, important cases you will get in the exams uh, on daily basis. So I think it's unjust to cover in one session. Yeah, yeah, neuro, neuro, neuro is very vast too. Yes, ma'am, we can arrange uh, another session with your help. And uh, because it, as you have said, that this is a very vast topic and, yeah. and we need your uh, presentation for that. So let me uh, cover a few slides of the GIT, okay? Then we will... Uh, uh, resume this session for another day okay, okay. so uh, uh, here we are dealing with again the horizontal beam uh, radiograph and the supine uh, abdominal radiograph so if you see uh, what kind of appearance of the bowel is is it's very mottling mottled pattern the air is seen all around as you see uh, in uh, pre previous slides the uh, bowel outline was very sharp Bowel outline is very was very sharp, not hazy like this. There is a lot of gas within the bowel wall. If you zoom them, there you can see there is the bowel wall, bowel wall containing air, a lot of intramural air. So this air is dangerous. This is called pneumatosis intestinalis. It's very dangerous. It's a sinister sign that patient is going into necrosis. Bowel is going to be gangrened and it's going to perforate very soon. One more thing you need to, it's very ominous sign and it's, you need to check. There is air in the portal vein. If you, are you going to appreciate? There is air in the portal vein. Now check. The air is seen within the portal vein over the liver, in the liver area. Here is going there in a branching uh, pattern. So this is again a sinister sign. So you, you need to urgently refer this case. And if you are still suspicious of the pneumoperitoneum in this particular scenario, you can use that same technique, let, left, left lateral decubitus view, which we confirm in other uh, uh, in foreign body situation and in other things when, whenever we are uh, having some suspicion of the free air. 
So you can go and ask the technician that go and do a lateral left lateral decubitus view for the residual air. And uh, usually we can't perform CT scan in this patient because uh, it's a surgical emergency. So we don't perform, we directly rush this patient to the surgical department. Next. Next, please. So these are uh, these patients. Uh, if if they are conservatively treated uh, for some time, uh, they don't need surgery. Then they uh, tends to develop the uh, stricture formation, and sometime after surgery, they will develop the stricture formation. So you will get such kind of structures on the barium enema. So here, this is the stricture seen at the level of the sigmoid and the descending colon junction. Next. So this is uh, another thing which we commonly encounter in our routine practice that patient is pre presenting with the projectile vomiting and um, and whenever you think of the projectile non-bilious non kind of vomiting, uh, you are thinking of the pyloric stenosis. So for pyloric stenosis, x-ray is useless and uh, we don't recommend x-ray at all. But if patient uh, is having an x-ray in hand um, by himself, then you can only uh, just check uh, the pattern of the uh, bowel gas. So only there's a gas is sitting within the stomach rest you can see a bit amount of air over here but rest of the bowel is totally gasless so it means there is some obstruction is going on at the level of uh, proximal stomach or proximally somewhere at the duodenum level we can't say merely on the basis of the uh, chest abdominal x-ray so the ultrasound is the best modality or imaging modality of choice to to uh, to see about the thickness of the uh, muscle of the antrum and the rest of the measurements. Okay, so I'm I'm telling you about the muscle. This is the pyloric pyloric level. This is the pylorus on the ultrasound. This is the longitudinal view of the pylorus. Uh, let me do it. <clears throat> So this is a pylorus uh, muscle, longitudinal view of pylorus. So this is a muscle. This hole is the muscle that is being thickened, that is being hypertrophied on. And this one is the lumen. This one is the central part is the lumen and it's narrowed. So in this way, just uh, by measuring this lumen, by measuring this, the muscle thickness, you can easily uh, appreciate and give a sensible uh, diagnosis of the uh, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Again, it requires an, a surgical management. Next. So here are the uh, tra transverse and the longitudinal sections on the ultrasound as well as on the uh, diagrammatic illustration. So you just remember about the uh, muscle hypertrophic muscular layer that is 3 mm. It should be uh, normally it should be 3 mm. Then uh, you will uh, learn about the whole of the um, whole of the thickness from one part to the another part. It should be 15 mm and the whole of the length channel of the that is, should be the 17 mm normally three you just uh, remember three 15 17 few uh, literature uh, will give you uh, a different uh, uh, different var variable uh, values but these are the standard values so in this way you can easily um, make a diagnosis on the ultrasound which is a fast and easily available uh, everywhere nowadays next Next. So here, this is a case of incarcerated hernia. Again, don't forget to see the bowel pattern, as I told you. So here are multiple bowel loops in centered, gaze filled within the center of the abdomen. But where the bowel is going? Where is going? It's going towards the left inguinal region. Have you noticed? It's going toward the next uh, left inguinal region so it's causing obscuration obstruction at this level but on on the basis of x-ray we can't say we just raise the suspicion that there is an incarcerated hernia so we will confirm it on the further on ultrasound so in ultrasound there may be some if in case of uh, boys uh, there is uh, uh, some uh, inguinal hernia is associated with some other pathologies or in the in case of girls there may be some uh, there may be some ovaries inside there. So again, ultrasound would help us and uh, tell us about the detailed uh, evaluation. Next. 
so finally this is intersusception it's again very common in our setup you usually get the um, non specific bowel pattern on x ray you can't define it on the x ray again but ultrasound is the modality of choice in which it will give you a uh, uh, bowel within bowel appearance and it will give you a classic target appearance here you see on ultrasound uh, they it will show you this is the one bowel layer this is another bowel layer and this white area is the mesentery of the ecogenic mesentery of the bowel so this is intersusception intersusceptum and the mesentery few lymph nodes you may find some free fluid over here so in this way you can confirm about the intersusception next please next yeah this is the classic target appearance of the intersusception on the ct scan this is a, a, a intersusception appearance on the barium scan in which all of sudden the contrast is going there and all of sudden the, there's interruption in the flow of the contrast no contrast uh, going there distally uh, arrow is being marked and uh, on x ray uh, it's very difficult to say but uh, sometime uh, it very it is very classical uh, to describe as you saw here this is air containing uh, bowel and this is uh, uh, without air bowel it's invaginating in inside this bowel so sometime you may get the classical picture so again intersusception it can be self limiting or it can be due to some with the some lead points so again uh, management depend on the cause next okay so now i'm finishing um, uh, we have finished so far about the chest and the abdomen so we will cover the cns and rest of the sections uh, in the next classes yes ma'am thank okay. you so much for such uh, an excellent any kind of questions uh, welcome from your side Yes, round pneumonia have air bronchogram in them because these are the classical pneumonias. Only the rounded configuration is due to lack of air, collateral air drift. Thank you so much once again for a very nice and um, very well versed, I must say, audience who have participated a lot throughout the session. really encouraging Thank for me as well yeah i'm taking some questions how to differentiate lower lobe collapse or consolidation from sequestration yeah it's a very good question uh, in left lower lobe collapse basically what happened the collapse is uh, jet white uh, collapse is jet white you may not get any kind of air bronchogram within it because it's a collapse it's a complete airless uh, lung while in consolidation you will get an air bronchogram sign over there which we just taught and in sequestration you will get the same the air bronchogram sign so you can't differentiate basically uh, or in between the uh, left lower lobe consolidation and the sequestration but collapse you can because collapse is completely white without air bronchogram any other question i am happy to answer so no question yes ma'am i think there are no no more questions okay thank you so much thank you so much ma'am for giving us your time and for an excellent presentation we will arrange uh, uh, such sessions uh, in future as well with you inshallah inshallah thank so you so it all depends on the feedback basically 
if you people are willing to get more then i can happy to teach you yes i'm sure ma'am okay thank you thank you i think we should conclude our session our today's session